Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson 34. We're going to talk about spin, which is kind of another angular momentum. But before we get into spin, I want to do a little math. I want you to look at this binomial expansion of 1 plus x divided by n to the power n. If you expand that out, you'll notice that an interesting thing happens. Um, n factorial divided by n minus m factorial is just n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 down to n minus m plus 1. So it's m terms uh, with n, n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on. If you let n become large, so we're going to let the n value be, be a very large value, and we're going to have a finite value of x. So if n gets large, this x divided by n becomes very small. So that means only a small number of terms in this sum is actually going to contribute significantly. So we only have to look at m values that are very small compared to n, as n becomes very large. Now, in that limit, if you look at the thing, you'll notice that n factorial divided by n minus m factorial is very nearly n to the mth power. So the ratio of those two things approaches 1 as n becomes large. And as n becomes large, notice that smaller and smaller values of m become important. So then you take the limit as n approaches infinity, and you get the following result, that the, uh, that the sum reduces to what looks like a Taylor series. So what we end up with is nothing other than the exponential. In other words, the Taylor series is just the uh, exponential function. Uh, what does that have to do with us? Well, I want to imagine that we can invent an operator that shifts the wave function to the right or the left. So let's call it a displacement operator. You, you build a displacement operator with a, the amount you want to displace the wave function. You apply the displacement operator to the wave function, and you get out a shifted wave function that shifts to the right slightly. If the amount that it shifts to the right is small, then um, we can say that it's got to be 1 plus a little bit, because if the amount of shift goes to 0, it needs to revert to the identity. And for small amounts of displacement, we want something proportional to delta x. And I'm just going to propose that a thing that would do that would be the derivative operator that just takes the derivative of the wave function, multiplies by delta x. And then, uh, of course, that's going to be the change in the wave function. If I add that back to the identity, I should get something that displaces the wave function. Another way to look at that is if you look at the definition of the derivative, it's psi of x plus delta x minus psi of x divided by delta x. If you solve that for psi of x plus delta x, you'll see that uh, you'd get 1 plus the derivative times delta x. Of course, we want the other. We want 1 minus the derivative times delta x to shift the wave function to the right. So that's the idea. Now here's the interesting thing. We already have an operator that looks like the derivative, and that's the momentum operator. So if I fiddle around algebraically, I can rewrite this displacement operator in terms of our given, our known, momentum operator. And sometimes you'll see in the literature, sometimes you'll see written that momentum is the generator of displacement. And this is the sense in which this statement is meant, that you can build a displacement operator using the momentum operator in exactly this way. Um, now, what if I want a finite displacement? What if I want a displacement that's actually not very tiny, but very big? How do I do it? Well, I could just apply the displacement operator many, many times. Well, what do I get if I do that? Well, I get the displacement operator raised to the capital N power, where each displacement is a finite size, A, divided by capital N. But notice, that's exactly the situation we had in the math we did earlier. And so I don't have to go through all that again, but I can persuade you, I hope, that, in fact, you can make a finite displacement using the exponential. So the exponential function comes into play if you want to do a finite displacement. 
Notice that this is looking a lot like the time evolution operator, e to the minus i Hamiltonian over h bar times t, but now we're not displacing in time, we're displacing in space. So instead of a Hamiltonian, I need to use momentum. Now, let's do an example. Let's say we have a wave function, which is a pure value of k. Let's apply the momentum operator to that just to see what we get. You can see right away that you get h bar times k times the wave function back again. In other words, I happen to have chosen an eigenstate of the momentum operator, so I get it has an eigenvalue, h bar k. Now, what if I apply the displacement operator to that function? Well, because this function happens to be an eigenstate of momentum, I can just replace the momentum operator in the exponential with the momentum eigenvalue. The h bars cancel, and I get e to the minus i k a, a e to the plus i k x. If I multiply all that out, Notice I've got the wave function, but it's shifted to the right by an amount a. So it certainly works for a momentum eigenstate. Does it work for any other wave function? Well, yeah, it has to, because I can always rewrite any wave function as a superposition of momentum eigenstates. In other words, I can do the Fourier transform. And each Fourier component is a momentum eigenstate, and each Fourier component is going to be shifted to the right. So if I shift all the Fourier components to the right, and then I inverse Fourier transform, I'll get back to the same wave function, except it'll be shifted to the right. It makes obvious sense. It has to be true. All right. So the same thing works out for rotations. In other words, instead of translating in space, now we're going to rotate an angle. But the same basic argument applies. I just use angular momentum instead of momentum. And instead of ddx, I've got dd phi, or dd theta. So if I want to rotate about the z-axis, I'd apply the momentum displacement operator, or the, uh, yeah, the, the, I'm sorry, the phi displacement operator, the rotation operator. It's e to the minus lz over h bar times phi. And similarly, for rotations about the x-axis and the y-axis, I can play a similar game. So. I can build a rotation operator about any axis by using the angular momentum operator that measures, that uh, represents the component of angular momentum about that axis. And, uh, and that's all we need. Now we can move on to spin. So electrons and protons have a spin of 1 half. In principle, other particles, and there are other particles that have higher values of spin, but uh, well, let's start with spin 1 half since that's the most important for us right now. So you can deal with spin. It, it behaves much like angular momentum, except now that instead of L being an integer, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, L can now take on half integer values. And M can also take on half integer values, going from negative L to plus L. So if L equals a half, there's only two values of M, minus a half or plus a half. That's the idea. So. Uh, the operators operate the same way. In orbital angular momentum, we had L squared. In spin, we have S squared. In orbital angular momentum, we had L sub Z. In spin, we have S sub Z. But it's the same basic idea. So uh, with orbital angular momentum, we had L plus and minus. With spin angular momentum, we have S plus and minus. And they operate in exactly the same way. S plus and minus applied to a ket gives you a ket with one less or one more unit of z component of angular momentum. Now, um, let's, there's only two different states, so we can easily work out all the details. If you apply S plus to a half plus a half, you get zero. If you apply S plus to a half minus a half, you get h bar times a half plus a half. If you apply s minus to a half minus a half, you get zero. And if you apply s minus to a half plus a half, you get h bar times a half minus a half. So those results can be summarized and uh, used to construct matrix representations of s plus and s minus. So if you think of the plus a half, one, uh, half a spin and a plus one half z component, let's call that z plus and a half unit of spin with minus a half z component, we'll call that z minus. And we can represent those as two vectors, 
a 1, 0, and a 0, 1. So our basis is z plus and z minus. This is simpler than the L equals 1 case with orbital angular momentum where we had three basis vectors. Um, if you write out the matrix elements of S plus in that basis, you get the following result. Notice all it says is if you apply S plus to Z plus, you get nothing. If you apply S plus to Z minus, you get H bar times Z plus. And similarly for S minus, if you apply S minus to Z plus, you get H bar Z minus. If you apply S minus to Z minus, you get nothing. And why is this useful? It's useful because we can use it to build to construct the matrices to represent Sx and Sy. Because Sx is just going to be the sum of the raising and lowering operator divided by 2, and Sy is the difference divided by 2i. And if you put all that in, you get these two matrices. The, uh, the interesting thing is that these matrices have eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which we can solve for using the traditional approach for finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues. I won't bore you with the process. You can easily do it yourself on the back of a napkin or something. Um, but the eigenvalues turn out to be h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2. Um, that makes sense because the z component of spin only had h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2 as eigenvalues. And so the x and y components must have the same eigenvalues since Nature doesn't know the difference between x, y, and z. But an interesting part is the eigenvectors x plus, x minus, y plus, and y minus. Notice that each of these guys can be represented as superpositions of our z component basis. So it's just like spin angular momentum or uh, orbital angular momentum. Any angular momentum. Uh, eigenstate of value uh, with an angular momentum eigenvalue of L can be represented as a superposition of eigenstates of well-defined Z component of angular momentum. And uh, we'll see here in a moment uh, that we can actually show a spin angular momentum eigenstate that points in any direction in space. We're going to go back to those rotation operators we cooked up earlier if we start with a state that points in the positive z direction and then rotate it, we can make a state that points in any direction. So first, let's rotate this state that points in the z direction. Let's rotate it about the y-axis. That means we're going to rotate it in the xz plane, and it will get a theta value. So we'll just, mul we'll just rotate about the positive y-axis by an angle theta, and we'll get a vector that's in the x xz plane at an angle theta from the positive z-axis. Then we can rotate it in phi about the z-axis and we can make a vector that points in any direction that's allowed. So um, let's do that. We'll just write down the uh, rotation operators. Of course since these are states of spin we need to use spin angular momentum to do the rotation. Uh, first we rotate in y. Now remember, when we use the time evolution operator, what basis do we have to use to apply the time evolution operator? We had to write the state in the energy basis. Well now, we're going to rotate about the y-axis. So we need to write the z plus state in the y basis. What's the y basis? It's uh, y plus plus y minus over the square root of 2. That's the eigenvector. That's the, that's the value of z plus when expressed using eigenvectors of, <coughs> of y component of spin. If you go back to the eigenvector slide, you'll see that uh, z plus is equal to y plus plus y minus over the square root of 2. Now applying the spin operator is easy. y plus has a spin of plus h bar over 2. y minus has a spin of minus h bar over 2 in the y direction. So we can plug that in and we get e to the um, minus i theta over 2 times y plus plus e to the plus i theta over 2 times y minus. Now we want to apply the z component of spin operator, but the only way to do that is to rewrite y plus and y minus using the z basis. But those vectors again are defined back on the eigenvector page. You'll notice that uh, y plus is z plus plus i z minus, y minus is z plus minus i z minus, 
if we plug all that in, uh, f factor out the common term z plus and z minus, you'll see that uh, what we end up with is an expression that now just depends on theta and phi. Uh, one other point, you can multiply any state by a phase factor and it doesn't change the state. It doesn't change any physical consequences. So it makes sense to multiply by e to the i phi over 2. That gets rid of the first phase out in front and doubles the second phase. So in the end, we can express any spin state pointing in any direction in space in the z basis using uh, sine, cosine, and the complex exponential to adjust the magnitudes and phases of these two spin states. Uh, we're going to find this very useful when we get to talking about uh, teleportation and uh, entanglement and Bell's theorem and so on. We're going to use these exact states. So I want to point out that you can apply this exact same idea to the L equals 1 states we talked about last time and uh, you get the following result. This is the expression you'd deduce if you did the same rotation with the three components of L equals one spin uh, pointing in any direction in space. And you'll notice just as a check if you set phi equal to zero and theta equal to um, pi over two that you get exactly the result we were using. In other words the cosines go to zero, the sine goes to one and you get one half z plus plus one over the square root of two z zero plus one half z minus, which is exactly the way we built the state that had um, a angular momentum of one about the x-axis. And uh, you can build any other state exactly the same way. All right, have a good one.